So, so uh, before I get started, I'm just curious, how many of you have ever heard of the term thunder lizard before? Okay, so a few. So um, I'll, why don't I get started just level setting on that for a little bit. So um, yeah, so um, thunder lizard. So uh, the metaphor actually comes from Godzilla. So um, I'm interested in not just companies that are doing a startup, but companies that are doing something hyper exceptional. Uh, and I was seeking a metaphor to describe these companies, and I wanted it to combine the ideas of being big, adaptable, fearsome, uh, radioactive. And so and it, it just didn't seem right to use a term like disruptive innovation or something too, too academic-y sounding. And so even though we are in a, an esteemed academic institution right now, so I came up with this term Thunder Lizard about 20 years ago. Uh, and um, Thunder Lizards, for those of you who are not familiar with Godzilla, uh, were hatched from radioactive atomic eggs. And uh, this is actually uh, the stage of the market that we at Floodgate like to invest in. And so we like to say that our job is to spot radioactive atomic eggs. Uh, you know, when we invested in uh, Twitter, they weren't sure whether they were going to call it TWTR or TWTTR or voicemail 2.0. And um, you know, when, uh, when, when we invested in Lyft uh, before it launched, you know, we had to get comfortable with the, the legal ambiguity of, uh, of, of that service. And so, so you know, at, the, at the time that we see this stuff, it's hard to even know what it's going to mutate into. Uh, but, but, the, but the goal is to find companies that have sort of radioactivity at their roots. And then uh, they swim across the ocean and emerge with an attitude. And then, um, and then they begin to devour their startup competitors uh, right as they hit the beach. And then not long after that, uh, they begin to disrupt even more, uh, swiping holes into the sides of buildings. Uh, and then eventually they attack the incumbents. Uh, the incumbents in the market are represented by those trains that he's eating uh, like sausage links. So that is, uh, so now you know what thunder lizards are. And, uh, you know, I, I like to use that term because uh, we, we've, been, we've been lucky uh, to, uh, to have worked with some people who've arguably created these kinds of companies. So we haven't, we haven't been at this for very long. We got started a little over 10 years ago, but so far the cumulative exit value of the companies we've invested in is more than 30 billion. And so uh, some of those companies have ended up sort of, you know, breaking out in an exponential way. And so I thought, I thought it would be helpful, like a lot of, you're, you probably get a, a cross section of speakers uh, here. Uh, what I thought I would really focus on is what can we learn from the people who build these truly exceptional companies? Not just the top 1% of companies, but the 0.1% or the 0.01% of, of the very best startups. Um, so I have two main thoughts. Uh, the first thought is the exponential laws of entrepreneurship. And so the exponential, there's three exponential laws I'm going to talk about, and I think they basically animate startup opportunity. I think that they are fundamentally the three asymmetric weapons of the startup. Uh, the first is one that probably most of you, so how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Okay, everybody pretty much, right? So Moore's Law says that the performance of computing doubles every 18 months at a given price. Now, it's funny, we, we take Moore's Law uh, for granted, uh, but Moore's Law is very profound. Um, Moore's Law guarantees that the tech industry will remain magical. Uh, and the reason that Moore's Law is so powerful is because of the power of compound interest. Give me an incumbent of any arbitrary size, give Moore's Law enough time, and it will, re it will breach the advantage of any incumbent company, uh, no matter how powerful that company's position is in the market. And so the thing that is so important for our industry about Moore's Law is it guarantees a continuous supply of new awesome companies that change the way we view the world and that could be uh, potentially disruptive. How many people have heard of Metcalfe's Law? Just a show of hands. Okay, so not nearly as many people. So Metcalfe's Law is named after Bob Metcalfe. Metcalfe Bob Metcalfe is 
widely regarded as one of the prime movers of inventing the ethernet. Uh, and so Metcalfe's law is about network effects. So Metcalfe's law basically states that the value of a network is a function of the square of the number of the nodes. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Every new node that gets added to a network has the potential to connect to all the prior nodes of the network. And so as the, as the network gets larger and has more nodes, you know, some people argue that it's not 100% exponential, but it, it approaches exponential uh, increasing returns. Okay, how many of you have heard of the power law? Okay, not that many as well. This might surprise you. So um, there are more than 10,000 startups in a typical year created. And actually right now we're in a little bit more of a frothy time, so it's more like 20 to 30,000. 10 of those companies create 97% of all the exit value in the industry. Um, that's really hard for people to get their mind around. You know, like most, that, this, by the way, this is why venture capital and startups are not an asset class. Most asset classes follow things like the capital asset pricing model, or they follow things like a normal distribution of returns where you have a one sigma event this way for the better and a one sigma event this way for the worse. That's not how power laws work. They work like this, right? So my first, first angel fund I had that had Twitter in it, we made more than 500 times on our investment. It didn't matter that two other companies in that group of investments went public, Twitter dominated all the returns. Uh, in, our, in, our, in, in the next fund we had, demand force returned three times the fund by itself. Um, Lyft has that kind of power in the fund after that. And so it, here are some other statistics. So for example, what we find is in a typical startup year, the best startup of the year is generally more valuable than all other startups created that year combined. So Facebook was created in 2004, more valuable than all other tens of thousands of startups combined created in 2004. Um, Paul Graham once told me at Y Combinator, and I think that the values have flipped now because this is about three, four years ago. He told me at the time that Dropbox was worth more than all 550 other companies that they had run through their accelerator at the time, and that Airbnb was worth more than all the remaining combined, and so on. So what the power law basically states is that, generally speaking, the value of the best outcome will exceed the combined value of all the remaining outcomes. And then the value of the second best outcome will exceed the value of all the remaining outcomes, and so on. Okay, so I said that the first key thought was about exponential reasoning. This is tech entrepreneurship in one slide. It is leveraging the power of Moore's law and or Metcalfe's law to create an extraordinary outcome. That's the whole business. Everybody I know, well for the most part, who's really done well in Silicon Valley was involved in one of those extraordinary companies, either as a founder, as an employee, maybe even as a lawyer, right? But it's like, if you're, if you're not trying to be one of the top 10 companies of the year, you're competing with 9,990 other companies for 3% of the scraps in the industry. And so the, the first thing that I like to emphasize to people when they start a company is, start a company that's worthy of your talents, that you think represents the absolute utmost gift you have to offer to this world in your life. Because to be one of those, that's what it takes. People shouldn't just be doing a startup. Well, I should back up. If you decide to just be doing a startup, that's fine. But that's, that's kind of like the decision to join a nonprofit, or it's kind of like a decision to, you know, it's kind of a labor of love, it may make the world better, but don't do it because you think you're gonna make money approaching it that way because that's not what the objective function uh, of the industry is. So then, about now, people often ask me, okay, great, there's three exponential laws, there's Moore's law, there's Metcalfe's law, I wanna combine them in some way uh, to create a huge outcome, but like, how do I, 
how, you know, how do I harness the potential energy of those three laws into the mechanical energy of an awesome startup that actually does the disrupting and, and you know, achieves its thunder lizard ambitions? So that's what I, what I wanted to work on. And this is a thought that, um, it's a framework that we like to use at, at, at Floodgate that sort of captures a lot of uh, what we've seen as patterns in some of the really good companies. And so we call it the value stack. Um, the value stack is really, you can think of it as a hierarchy of powers. And so as you go up the stack, the force multiplication of each power builds upon the power beneath it and amplifies it even further. And so the first one we'll talk about soon is proprietary power. The purpose of proprietary power is to have an unfair advantage. Um, the best way to compete is to choose not to, and proprietary power allows us to avoid the trap of competition. Uh, product power is the thing that everybody talks about in Silicon Valley right now. It's build something people want, product market fit, awesome user experience, all that kind of stuff. But there's some subtlety there too. Company power has to do, so be before I jump into this topic, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the term technical debt or management debt. Okay, so um, technical debt is sort of like when you make short-term expedient decisions of the technology that sort of cost you later, right? You, maybe in order to ship something on time, you had to cut some corners and the, the architecture wasn't as elegant as it could have been, or the, you know, the, the, just the attention to detail or bug fixing maybe wasn't as good as it could have been. And so um, when I was a kid, there was, this, there was this commercial Fram oil filters. And the guy would say, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And, and so technical debt is sort of like when you, when, you, when you put off some things that you have to solve later, but and they cost you more money and time after the fact. And management debt is the same thing but it's for lack of having management systems uh, in place. And you know, if you have too much management debt, if the company starts to take off and do really well, you don't have the internal capacity and wherewithal to scale to the speed of the opportunity might scale. And then the last thing is category power. Um, this is something that I think, you know, just like in the last 10 years, like I remember, um, getting to know Steve Blank really well about 10 years ago, and he was working on this book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany, and it kind of ushered in this era of customer development, and then Eric Ries was talking about lean startups. I think category design over the next couple of years will be one of the next frontiers that people start to talk about in Silicon Valley sort of at the same level that now they're talking about, that have been talking about lean startups and customer development. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, let's start with proprietary power, uh, avoiding the need to compete. So when I was in business school, if you'd asked the typical MBA student at the time, what is capitalism? They would have said something like, it is a system characterized by multiple firms competing for the preference of empowered customers in a free market or something like that. Um, and I guess I would assert that that's actually not true, that true capitalism and capitalists are opposites. Um, I like to say that a capitalist is a person who aggregates capital based on an unfair advantage. And so those are the best capitalists I know. And so why is that important? Well, what I find is that too many people in Silicon Valley, too many entrepreneurs, too many companies engage in what I like to call mindless competition. And you've probably seen pitches like this before where one of the slides in the deck has the company presenting and then five other companies and we check all the boxes and the other companies check a fraction of the boxes. And when I see that slide, I almost always pass on the investment. And the reason is it bugs me when somebody doesn't realize that being different is more important than being better. And it doesn't, it, it, and that the best competitive strategy is to choose not to compete. We talked about this already. Uh, sometimes uh, I get in trouble for using the word monopoly. Uh, that word offends people sometimes in other places. Um, but so, like, let me just use a more benign word um, or term. Do you have a structural competitive advantage? 
And so first mover advantage, when you think about it, isn't a very durable advantage. There's a lot of smart people in this world. Uh, but if you have a structural competitive advantage, what that means is that even at scale, your competitors can't attack you effectively. So you, know, you think about it, for example, Bing spent, has now spent over $10 billion in search trying to dislodge Google and has gotten nowhere trying. And, so, and that's because Google has a, 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 a structural competitive advantage. We won't use the term monopoly to describe Google's search position. Um, OK. Sources of proprietary power. This is the one that I think usually applies most to people like at, say, Stanford. Um, it's deep technology. And I like to say that really harnessing a technology advantage is a proxy for leveraging Moore's Law. And so whenever I look at a company that says they have a technology advantage, I'm interested in a couple things. One is just what is the advantage and why would it be hard to copy? But then the other part of the question is why now? You know, why, why did something in the world change to open the world for this opportunity? You know, why, if, if, if you're doing topological data analysis, why couldn't that have been done five years ago? Why couldn't that have been done 10 years ago? Well, it turned out that computational capacity in the cloud was improving, improving, improving at the rate of Moore's Law and eventually con con converged at a critical point where it became practical. So there are two companies. The reason I like using these examples, apart from the fact that I just like the companies and the founders, is they both came out of Stanford. And they both have technology depth in their advantage. So the first one is a Yazdi. How many of you have heard of a Yazdi, just out of curiosity? So quite a few. So, well, a few. Um, more than I thought, though. Um, so what a Yazdi has is a, I'm, I'm going to butcher, Anne will probably not like the, the lack of precision that I use to describe it, but there's this, there's this capability called topological data analysis. And there were a bunch of PhDs and smart students at Stanford who'd been inventing this new way of analyzing data. And what, what topological data analysis does is it lets you run data through a system. And rather than start with a query, I'm looking for this, it lets you find unexpected relationships in the data. And it turns out that a lot of data has emergent properties. A lot of data is very complex. It's unstructured. And sometimes the fact that you think you know the question means you have a bias about what you're looking for. Sometimes you just want to say, run the data through this thing, show me a fractal, and then I could see patterns I didn't even know I was looking for. So it's more of a discovery-oriented way of finding patterns rather than a query-based way of finding patterns. So when we funded a YASD, you say to yourself, OK, is anybody going to pay for that? We had no idea, right? When Ann when Ann chased down Gurjeet and tried to write him a check outside of his classroom, um, I, don't, I think all it was was a set of math papers. Like, I, you know, there was no business plan. There was like, I didn't even understand it, to be honest. It was a bunch of calculus topological data equations. And I was like, OK, well, that's great. But I thought we were talking about a YASD and this business plan. And, and like, there was, there was none of that. So anyhow, so in a company like that, you have high market risk, right? You don't know if you're going to ever find a buyer for this technology. You don't know if you can even make a product that people will buy. But do you have a lot of risk that somebody's going to copy the technology? Not so much, right? Because like the vast majority of all of the people in the world who had invented this TDA approach were early employees of a Yazdi. And so like if the world decides, oh boy, I need me some of that topological data analysis, <laughs> chances are a Yazdi's got an unfair advantage, you know, in delivering that. Um, second company, in Scopix. So um, not all of you might be able to read this. Um, Fluorescence microscopes. Uh, they're, they're normally this big. Uh, they're like the size of, they, you fit them on a table. They cost like a quarter of a million bucks. You can't move them very easily. Unfortunately, in order to have this even be semi-legible, people probably don't realize this thing is smaller than a shot glass. It's like half the size of a shot glass. So you can put, plug it into the USB port of a side of a computer. You could put one of these things on the top of a mouse, like literally as it's scurrying around, and study how different neurons in the brain fire. 
So what happens when it discovers cheese? What happens is it learns a certain path in the maze. What happens if it sees cheese five times in a row and then the next time it doesn't? Uh, you begin to be able to explore the brain in, in new ways that you never could have before. And because these things are so small, you can put them in arrays, you can take them to developing parts of the world that can't afford these $250,000 big microscopes that are hard to move in the first place. And so, you know, if you could build a full stack of software on top of these microscopes, then you might have something. But like yet again, right, this isn't, you know, like a, one of the companies I invested in a long time ago that had network effects was Dig. And Kevin Rose started Dig for $1,500 over a weekend. And you're not just going to have somebody in a garage start this for $1,500 over a weekend, right? This is somebody with heavy-duty PhD chops, you know, understanding uh, stuff uh, that nobody else understands. The reason I bring this up is that a lot of times when I talk to students, you know, like sometimes I'm an advisor in some of these classes, and I've noticed that a lot of times the, 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 the startup idea they want to do in the class is like, okay, we're like a social network, but for mobile phones and people at college doing X, Y, Z. And I'm like, God, what, what, a, what, a, what a tragic waste of the opportunity. Because I think that a lot of you will appreciate someday, maybe more than now, that a lot of the stuff that you're working on is very cutting edge. Like when I was when I was at Stanford, I was just like, okay, you know, there's this new thing coming out called C++, and you know, it kind of seems like it might be a thing here pretty soon, and nobody's really using it yet, and none of my friends back home know anything about it. But I get, yeah, I guess I better learn C++. Why not? And so, like, th there's just things that happen where you're like literally on the cutting edge of something, and you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, to, to have a technical breakthrough insight that the rest of the world doesn't widely understand yet. It's, it's, like, it's like I'm an old guy, right? I'm like in my 40s. And I've lived my entire life in Cartesian coordinates, right? Now, one of you may be, you may discover, hey, the world also runs in polar coordinates. And if that's all you've seen, right? If you're a 20-year-old and the only way you've ever viewed the world is through polar coordinates, you don't have to do any translation, right? You, I mean, you just know what to do. Whereas old guy like me, I'm like, okay, well, how do I normalize that point in a Cartesian coordinate space with the polar space, right? You're always going to have a jump on me. And you're always going to have a jump on most people in the world. And so one of the things I encourage students is, first of all, most people shouldn't start a company in college. Um, you know, they should, they should be involved with the great companies and stuff like that. We can talk about that later. But one thing I encourage students who are interested in the startup process to do is to spend time trying to figure out where the most breakthrough cutting edge work is happening right here on campus that is technically deep, rather than trying to be the next social networking app, which will get a lot of attention if it takes off, right? Evan Spiegel, Snapchat, congrats. Kevin Systrom, Instagram, congrats. But that's like, that's like saying, I want to be like the guy that got hit by lightning. It's very, very hard to deterministically do that. Okay, and then the next, the next advantage is network effects. Um, the, these, in my experience, are more subtle. Um, so, you know, we've had three investments that I think demonstrate it well, Twitter, Lyft, and Twitch.tv. Um, you know, the, the thing that I would say about network effects is that um, if you're going to build a network effects business, <laughs> I think it's important to ask yourself, what is my network? What are the nodes of the network? How do they connect with each other? Where are the connections strong? Where are they not strong? Is it a global network? Is it a hub and spoke network? Uh, what does it mean for me to be the network operator? Uh, interestingly, uh, network effect businesses have existed for a long time. They, they existed with the railroads. They existed with the canals. They existed with like RCA and with records and TV. Um, they existed with Craig McCaw and McCaw Cellular. And all of those people thought of themselves as not just lean startup, innovator, you know, iterators. They, they, they conceived of what the network was in the first place. And um, this is a book I highly recommend. Um, it's, it's by a guy named Yohai Bankler. Uh, used to be at uh, Yale. I think he just moved over to, to Harvard. Uh, the book is called The Wealth of Networks. 
And what I think is good about it is it takes a very structured way of thinking to the approach of building networks. And I think that like, just like you wouldn't build a deep technology business without really understanding the technology in depth, most people, when they build a network effects business, I believe should have an ongoing hypothesis of their network at fine grain detail uh, that, that evolves and migrates through time. Okay, so now we're gonna go to product power. Um, this is kind of the mistake I see a lot of people make. I, I jokingly refer to it as the product escape process. Uh, you know, product gets built, and it escapes out of the building and into the market. And then we go get customers. And, um, and, and uh, th then we iterate. The customer says, oh, no, 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 you're, you're way off. And then we say, okay, well, you know, you, you, you wanted a left-handed smoke shifter instead of right-handed smoke shifter. Okay, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make it left-handed. But, you know, the, the company just kind of gets off to a bad start because they have this wrong idea that it's kind of this sequential activity where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a product and then I'm going to launch it and try to, try to get some people to use it and then see if I'm right. Um, to me, like, and so Mark Andreessen has some great quotes, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to a blog that he wrote in a second. In a great market, a market with lots of real potential customers, the market pulls product out of the startup. Conversely, in a terrible market, you can have the best product in the world, absolutely killer team, it doesn't matter, you're going to fail. The number one company killer is a lack of market. Um, Andy Radcliffe has another way of saying it. When a, when, a, when a great team meets a lousy market, the market wins. When a mediocre team meets a great market, the market often wins. Have you ever seen a startup where you're like, how in the hell could they have been successful? It's because they met a great market. And they, they just, sometimes your product, your market, it just has the magic. You can't beat customers off with a stick. They just want it. Um, I've had this happen to me before where, in spite of the fact that the product just seemed horrible on the surface, it just didn't matter. People, people wanted it really bad. I'll give you an example of this where the market was really good. At Chegg, uh, we decided we wanted to do textbook rentals. It's one of our early investments. And I don't know, does anybody ever use Chegg at, at Stanford? Okay, cool. So, so we're like, okay, our textbook rental is going to work. We're like, we don't know. We don't even have a warehouse. And so we're just like, okay, what do we do? So somebody would rent a textbook from Chegg. We'd ship it from Amazon. And they'd, they'd, they'd call us up and say, what's, what's up with this? I thought I'm renting a textbook from Chegg and you shipped it from Amazon. What's the deal? And we'd say, oh, it's just a clerical supply chain error. Uh, would you please ship it back to Chegg? Here's our address. But people put up with it because they just love the idea of renting a textbook. They're like, let me get this straight. A textbook cost me 100 bucks. You'll rent it to me for 35. Sign me up. And so they just kept renting them, no matter how disorganized we seemed uh, in the early days. So to me, product market fit is more of like a, it's more of like a dance between the product and the market. You know, it's like if you ever see two people doing the tango, I look at it like the product is leading the dance, but the market is tangoing with the product in a, in a sort of a, you know, I'll try to be G-rated in my language, but sort of an intimate sort of back and forth uh, <laughs> between them. And what I find is that if you want to get the tango right, the first thing is to really identify the market. Um, large, strong customer desire at the right time. Uh, you, want, you want to find markets where people gravitate to your idea and want it right now as soon as possible, even if it's half done. And then that market pulls the product. You know, it, so it's interesting, when a market pulls a product, this is what it feels like inside the building. Nobody's debating what the features of the next version ought to be because they're like, oh my God, this stuff is flying off the shelves and our customer needs us to fix X, Y, and Z. And you're like, okay, well, let's fix it. And so that's what it feels like when the market's pulling the product. Whereas when the market's not pulling the product, the, the conversations in the building are arguments over why aren't those customers smart enough to figure out how awesome our stuff is? And you know, back and forth, and who's, who, is my vision more right than your vision about, about what the product ought to be? And then the last part of it is delighting the customer in the other direction. So you know, the, the, the part of the dance where the customer follows is 
they're pulling product and where you lead is you, you assimilate that information on, all the time and then delight the customer. So, that, so by the way, the first thing that I see, we talk about this not doing the dance is the first mistake I see in people not uh, achieving product market fit. And conversely, the people who do this well often get to there faster. The second thing is not clearing the threshold of delight. So a lot of people think their product is good and that rational customers ought to like it and buy it. But customers, I won't use the exact words, they need to say WTF, I didn't know that that was even possible. Are you kidding me? So I'll, I'll give you an example. When Lyft first launched, we had a, um, an associate at the time, he's now at Rothenberg Ventures, Tommy Leap. And uh, he was the Stanford tree, for those of you who've been here for a while. And um, you know, we launched Lyft, well, we Lyft launched Lyft, and we're like, I hope it goes well. Two weeks after they launch, Tommy comes into the team meeting and says, we're gonna crush it in this deal. And we're like, yeah, Tommy, you know, we're excited about Lyft too, it's awesome. He's like, I've used it 10 times in the last week. He's like, have you tried it yet? We're like, well, I'm gonna get around to it. I haven't been to San Francisco, but you know, I mean, I'll check it out. He's like, dude, it just, it rocks. You just get out your phone, there's a car on the map, you ask for a car, and it picks you up. And like, keep in mind, this is before Uber decided to react to Lyft with UberX. It's so like, nobody had ever had a service before where just some stranger in a car pulls up. When you request the ride, it takes you where you wanna go. And you know, keep in mind, at the time, the cabs in San Francisco were horrible. Right, so you did never get a cab in San Francisco. And so it was one of these experiences where I remember the first time I tried it, it was obvious to me that this product was gonna be a huge success. There was, there was just no doubt in my mind. Um, how many of you have been in a Tesla with the autopilot yet? Okay, so let me describe how it works. You know, you're driving the car, and then there's this little blue thing that shows up. It looks like a steering wheel. And that means that it knows enough about the road that it can self-drive if you want it to. So you just double click back the cruise control stock and it goes boom, boom. And then it just starts driving itself. And the first time that happens, you're just like, that did not just happen, right? You're just like, no way. There's like, there's just like a hidden camera here. There's like somebody, somebody hiding inside the car, right in the, in the, in the hood. You know, there's, this can't be real. Um, but what I'm finding is that more and more in today's world, that's the threshold that you want to clear. So, you know, we talked earlier about proprietary power. One of the things that I appreciated about the way a Yazdi did its product was they didn't just have topological data analysis under the hood. They actualized that advantage in the product by making it look awesome with these fractals. And so the best places to delight the customer are in the areas where your fundamental advantage just sings. And if you stick the landing on that, not only do you delight the customer, but it's really hard for other people to do what you just did. Okay, suggested reading. Andreessen has a really good um, excerpt, a, a good blog entry, The Only Thing That Matters, it's called. Uh, and it talks all about product market fit, the theory of it, why it's important, how to get it, how not to. You know, I've always liked uh, Steve Blank's book, The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And then um, The Innovator's Guide to Growth has a great chapter on um, mastering emergent strategies and how to systematically kind of dance that tango with the customer uh, and turn assumptions about the product and the customer into facts. Okay, I, th I think I need to go a little quicker. Um, company power. This is for preparing for rapid scaling. Th there's really two things we're interested in here. One is a scalable business model, and one is uh, scalable management systems. Um, now you think about it, if, if you have a product that people love and that only you can deliver, you'd have to be an idiot not to be able to make money with that, right? Because you have something people want that only you can deliver. And so that's why getting the first foundational parts are so important. You know, if you get proprietary and product power nailed, you have a business model. You just have to discover it, but it is there always. Um, and then increasing margins and pricing power are proof that the first two layers are strong. That, you know, it, it's axiomatic that if your pricing power is going down, the first two layers aren't that strong. Either that or you're dumb at pricing. But it's more likely that you've overestimated how compelling your product is or how strong your competitive advantage is. 
Um, I think that, that uh, this book, Business Model Canvas, I think it's called Business Model Generation, but the, but the, but the, the framework is the Business Model Canvas by uh, Alex Osterwilder uh, is, is, is good to look at for this. But a lot of what I find about business modeling is it's just intuition. You know, you just, when you get to know the customer really well and what they value, they just, it just seems to work. The other thing I found is that customers often will pay more money when the price is clear. And they will often resist paying less money when the price is unclear. And so being clear about the price is very often more important than having a high price versus a low price. So I would always tend to be biased towards having a clear high price uh, that, the, that the customer understands. It relates back to your value. Uh, scalable management systems, I put these up only just because to call them out. Uh, culture, do you define it or do you just kind of let it happen? So a lot of the good companies that I've seen actually proactively define their culture and they, they emphasize what that is their first 20 employees and then it kind of takes a life of its own. Why do you want that? It's sort of like when, um, when ducks fly south for the winter, you don't have to tell the ducks in the back of the V get in a V, they just know. And when a company gets into blitz scaling mode, you don't have time to tell the hundreds of new employees that you hire, here's how decisions get made here, here's what we value, you know, here's how we make trade-offs at the margin. They have to know, they have to be programmed in, their, in, the, in the DNA of how they participate in the company. Uh, basic management systems, this has to do with just one-on-one -on -one meetings, board meetings, team meetings, forecasting frameworks. You know, what gets covered in those meetings, what shouldn't get covered in those meetings. Just having a sort of a philosophy of that going in can save a lot of time and avoid a lot of management debt. Compensation strategy, I'm very surprised how few companies, if I go to them and say, what is the role of cash, stock, and bonuses in your company? What is the strategic logic for why you have each one? Usually they can't answer that. Uh, and being able to answer that both helps you retain the awesome people but it also helps you recruit people with a competitive advantage because those people, rather than just put you in a line in an auction, say, oh wow, this is a real company. This company has a philosophy of how they compensate. That must mean that they actually have a point of view about what makes the company great and what makes the people at the company great. Um, hot teams we could get to in the Q&A. It's one of my favorite topics, um, but I, I don't know if, if I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll do the quick version. So, NASA landed on the moon in 1969, and people were like, how the heck did that happen? HP didn't even have a pocket calculator yet. Uh, and they discovered that there were some teams that were a thousand times more productive than normal teams. One team had to put a, an antenna on top of a mountain, and there were no roads up to the mountain. So like, what do we do? They say, let's ask our boss. We're behind. We got to do something. They say, oh, no, no, no. If we ask management, nothing will ever happen. So one person says, who has the biggest helicopter in the entire world? And they say, I, I don't know, I don't know. So they find out, it turns out it's, it's the US Navy. They say, hey, it's NASA, US Navy, can you loan us a helicopter? The Navy says, screw you, NASA, you know, I don't, <laughs> you don't get my helicopters. They say, okay, here's the deal. If we don't get your helicopters, we can't do this antenna. And if we don't do this antenna on top of the mountain, we're not gonna land on the moon in 1969 like JFK said we would. And so they say, how many do you need? So. <laughs> flew all the parts of the antenna on top of the mountain, assembled the antenna, and the NASA moon landing was a thousand examples of that. And so like when you're in a startup, you want to have that vibe of the goal is super important and you can make it happen. And in fact, if you don't make it happen, it won't happen. Forget performance reviews. Like great startups have hot teams that cut through the crap and get through whatever obstacles are inevitable to come along the way. Okay, these are three books I recommend. Andy Groves is awesome, High Output Management. Uh, I like uh, Sutton's new book, Scaling Up Excellence, and then I also like the notes from uh, Reed's class, Reed Hoffman on, on, on blitz scaling. Okay, category power. Category kings, they don't just make something to sell to people. They introduce the world to a new category of product or service. Category kings, they replace our point of view from what we understood yesterday to what we now believe. And ultimately, they change how people and businesses spend money. Here are some examples. 
When I was a kid, people didn't pay multiple dollars for a cup of coffee. But Starbucks convinced me and a whole bunch of people to rethink our spending habits as it related to coffee. Amazon Web Services, right? Not just a service, a whole new category. Um, there weren't any digital music players that would play thousands of songs in your pocket before the original iPod. In fact, I would argue that Jobs' great genius in his second act was he invented three new categories. The, the digital music player, the smartphone, and the tablet. Um, I, this is a, an example I kind of like Elvis. So Elvis, Elvis changed our point of view from jazz on steroids to rock and roll. You know, so El Elvis defined the category of rock and roll. Um, category kings usually capture 70 to 80 percent of the profit pool in a, in a given market. These guys, I think, are doing some really interesting work. Um, uh, Playbigger.com, uh, Christopher Lockhead, Al Ramadan um, uh, have been friends for a long time. Uh, they're going to come out with a book pretty soon that talks about category design, but I think their website does a good job of um, talking about some of these issues. I, b I believe that uh, category design is going to become an increasingly prevalent topic in how people think about uh, building value uh, in, their, in their startups. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly through this. What is the purpose of a seed round? Primarily, it's to marry proprietary and product power. If using a seed round, I can prove that I've created something that people love that's defensible, that was a good seed round. And then I just lay early groundwork in company power and category power. Um, the next round, right, what I call the execution round, usually it's the A and the B rounds. It's creating the flywheel for blitz scaling. It's hiring those early executives. It's sort of creating sort of the infrastructure to, to be able to scale when product market fit becomes understood in the company. And then uh, the later stage rounds is about capturing the profit pool from an emerging category. Final thought, okay. So you're gonna find, you're gonna be surprised about this. Uh, you don't have as much time as you think. Um, you all are much younger than I am, um, but I, I could promise you that sitting where you're sitting feels like yesterday. And um, you're in a position of privilege. Uh, you know, most of you in this room are Stanford students. Um, and so the thing that I would highly urge you to consider is to only do things that you think have a chance to be legendary. Um, it takes just as much work to do something mediocre as to do something legendary. And the mistakes you'll make, if you make them, in the next decade or so will be because you didn't take the time to consider if the next thing that you were going to do was truly legendary. Don't let yourself be 30 years old having been at four mediocre startups. Like that's, that's a bad use of your first decade out of school. Um, a good use of your time, regardless of whether you do a startup or not, in my opinion, is to always work with the people who excite you, who you think are excellent, who will make you better, to engage with the projects that you think are going to make a difference, and just to commit yourself without exception to doing kick-ass exceptional work. D just don't forget that. You have your whole life ahead of you to get the cumulative benefits of that. Um, there will be temptations. There will be chatter and noise. But just turn off the noise and the hype and just stay focused on that. Um, and I think that if you can do that and, and put all your energy and enthusiasm into those things that have a chance to be truly legendary, um, that, that's how you get involved in exceptional things that you're proud of and that you look back on and you get to enjoy your life tr twice because you get to remember all the cool things that you did. So. Um, Anyway, I should probably stop and do Q&A now. Uh, are there any questions? I, I should probably take your question since, since, you, since you sat in the front row. I should probably take your question first. Yeah. I just have a question about Thunder Lizards, right? So yes. do, you, do you care if 
a thinner lizard is too radioactive. What I mean by this is like, what it, how, like, do you, how do you assess, you know, the viability of a product? I think special regard to technical uh, advantage that you were mentioning, right? Do you care kind of like how long the incubation period is? That's what I'm thinking about. And how, how much potential a product has, right? Okay. If it's not viable in the next five years, is it, is it worth it? Yeah, so, so let, let me see if I can phrase the question right. So you're, you're kind of saying, okay, how, how, um, how patient are you with these kind of technologies that kind of, they're, they're radioactive, but maybe they never turn into a monster, right? They're just kind of sitting in a beaker and just, they look radioactive, but Geiger counter's kind of going off, but nothing's really happening. Um, it's funny, like I like to make fun of my ability to predict what any of these startups are going to do. And so my investment style is to invest in projects that have super high potential energy, but very ambiguous, what I like to say, mechanical energy, right? I don't know what it's going to become, but I know it feels very radioactive. You know, so like um, uh, Twitch.tv, it started out as Justin.tv. Justin Can walks into a coffee shop. I'd never met him before. I was talking to the guys from Weebly. And Justin walks in, they, they say, hey, we think you're a cool guy and we, we would like you to meet Justin, he'd like to pitch you. He walks in, he's got a baseball cap, a camera, and wires going into a backpack. I mean, I thought that the security would stop him somehow, right? And he says, I'm gonna live cast my life. And I'm like, I'm like, Justin, come on, that's stupid, right? That's ridiculous. And I'm like, but how do you even do that? He says, well, the internet's kind of a hostile networking environment. It's really hard to do live video on the internet, so we've invented a bunch of technologies, and I'm, there's me, and there's a couple guys from Yale, a couple guys from MIT, and we've invented this way to stream live video over the hostile networking environment that's the internet. And I was like, that's my kind of deal. Because I was like, okay, I could see live video might be a thing someday. Now, it ended up morphing into Twitch, which you could say arguably is not really live video, but, but I've made more money on those kind of bets. You know, Evan Williams, right, at Twitter, um, he did this company called Odeo, podcasting company, went out of business, he gave me my money back. I said, you don't owe me my money back. And he said, well, you need to take it because some of the other investors want it back. I'm like, I'll take it back only if you let me do your next thing. So he's like, I'm working on a side project, I'm gonna call it Voicemail 2.0 or Twitter. And I'm like, what does Twitter do? And he says, you say what you're doing. And I'm like, then what happens? And he says, uh, 140 characters or less. And I'm like, what's the roadmap? There is no roadmap. What's the revenue model? There is no revenue model. Um, well, why do you think this is a company, Evan? Um, I figured I did blogger software. A million people wrote blogs. I figure if 10 million people do microblogs, the burden of proof is on the people who are negative. And I was like, that's my kind of thing. And so I believe that at my stage of the market, People try too hard to predict what's going to happen, and they let all of the things that could go wrong with their prediction cause them not to invest. Whereas if I see exponentially high potential energy, I have a portfolio and a few, only, only say a third of them do we have to be right that they're going to find the promised land. And so uh, I, I tend to, to, to favor the high potential energy and, and just let, let, the, let the great entrepreneurs do their work. Yeah, sure. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I'll take yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm Lawrence. Thank you for being here. Yep. Uh, you were talking about uh, monop uh, structural advantage. Yeah, structural competitive <laughs> advantage. Yeah, yes. so uh, how about when you have a network effect, but it's hyper local, so it matters the location, like Lyft, Uber, or food delivery? Right. How, how do you. Yeah, so the. the, the um, what, what some of those companies get wrong, so what Lyft got right is they crushed San Francisco before they went to other towns. Yeah. Where they could have gotten themselves in trouble would have been to say, well, we got the first mover advantage, let's go into five cities right away and spread out, spread their efforts too thin. And so like, it kind of goes back to sort of network theory. We, we knew that Lyft, if it worked, was gonna be sort of like, a, almost like a hub and spoke network where you prove the network effect in one town and then based on the success metrics of that proof, you raise money to go into other towns. I think the other thing that Lyft got right is they understood that they were gonna to have to raise a lot of money to, to, make, to, to build this kind of a network. And so if you're gonna have lo networks that start local and then spread, 
you have to convince yourself, in my opinion, that you have the team and the idea and the credibility to raise a whole lot of money if you succeed locally fast. Uh, I think you also have to succeed locally fast, right? Like if you're kind of busting your pick against succeeding locally, you just kind of get trapped there and never. So you know you want you want the network locally to, to hyper accelerate, and then you need to be be the kind of team that can walk in to Andreessen Horowitz like the Lyft guys did and say, "I want sixty million dollars," and, and to spread to spread this idea. Uh, but but there's a there's a very important timing and sequence to doing that. Others raise money in China, wherever, and uh, yeah. And and by the way, it's a very good point. There are all kinds of companies that are raising money for food delivery and network effects kind of stuff, and um, I I I don't understand how they raised. Uh, like a lot of these companies, I don't know how they ever make money. But I I'm thankful that they'll deliver my food to me. <laughs> um, th you know, th thanks Sand Hill Road. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. That, uh, in any given year, 10 out of 10,000 companies take 97% profits. Give or take. Uh, yep. So that's one in a thousand. That's a terrifying thought to any investor. How do you convince rational people to put up their money for this kind of uh, risk? Okay, so the question is uh, let me get this straight. You invest in an asset class where 10 out of 10,000 make 97% of the money. That sounds super risky. How like what what person would ever give you money to go invest in that approach to investing? Okay, um, uh, what what we find is that uh, venture capital is kind of like a lottery game where the same people seem to keep getting the winning tickets, and so the way you convince uh, someone to invest in a venture fund is you convince them that you have some proprietary insight or attack vector or unfair advantage into accessing those top 10 companies. Uh, I think that if you do not have that, by the way, your venture capital fund doesn't have a business. right? So like I, I would say conversely, if you don't have an unfair advantage to getting those winning lottery tickets, and this is, by the way, why so many venture firms lose money. Almost, almost every single venture firm loses money, and then a small fraction that keep getting the winning lottery tickets make crazy good money. And so, you know, the, the, the key is, just like when you're a startup, the key is, as a fund, to convince the investor that you're a hyper-exceptional uh, venture fund. And in the end, I think you either have to have a great strategy or you just have to have the result and say it's an existence proof. Yes, Tina. So you've told us these great stories about these companies that we all know about. Uh -huh. uh, what about the things you're investing in now that you're most excited about? Oh, gosh. Um, Let's see, what should we talk about? Because um, some of them may not want us to talk about it yet. Uh, there, there's a company that we invested in in um, 2014 called Lob that um, is doing sort of like APIs for physical print. So they're kind of in the genre of like Stripe and Twilio and they've gotten off to a very fast start and they're, they're, they're doing very well. Uh, there's a company that's super early that I'm excited about called Dispatcher that was started by a, a actually a computer science student here at Stanford uh, that has uh, closed some very large contracts that are unusually large for how uh, for how young they are. So I think that they they're doing a really good job. Um, you know, Anne has an investment in a company that I think is showing a lot of signs of being interesting called Virage Sale. Uh, which is you know moving pretty quickly, and what what else are some of the recent ones that, that you'd say? Greatest that we can talk about. The greatest is I think has a has a chance of being really good, and there's a few that aren't quite as famous yet that we feel like we've been working with for a long time that I think are good. You know, Refinery Twenty Nine. You know, Dan Greenberg dropped out of Stanford to start Share Through. They're doing really well. Um, yeah, so and then and then there's a few I wish I could talk about, but I just don't want to put put the guys on the spot yet. Not in front of your huge podcasting audience. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so it seems like there's a lot of companies that are ruling a category now that weren't actually the original innovator in that field. So like Facebook obviously came after Friendster, but was able to sort of take that first move advantage away from them. So do you feel like the, it's more important to be on the cutting edge of the technology or to identify you know, when there's a butt 
and, and then somehow overtake that advantage? It's, you know, the, the way I sort of look at it is, um, first of all, there's a, there's a whole lot of randomness in startups, right? So a lot of this stuff is just super hard to predict. And you could, after the fact, you can tell all kinds of stories about why the facts fit what happened. Um, I sort of look at like the value stack as almost like a, a pre-flight check. You know, so I'm like, okay, a startup's a plane, I'm about to take off on the runway, and do I want to do that? Because like once, once I'm in the air, you know, I'm, I'm going. And so like I wouldn't necessarily say that like proprietary power without product power, I would never do that investment or that I've never seen a company succeed or that I've never seen a company first mover or be not the category king or whatnot. It's more I like to encourage entrepreneurs to sort of before they will that sucker into existence, you know, to kind of ask the diagnostic questions that, that kind of give them a sense for, do I want to really commit my life to this? The thing, I, I think that Zuckerberg just got some things incredibly right at Facebook. You know, he, not only the product and the, <laughs> the team, but um, he was like a sponge in terms of asking people questions. You know, he's always, always learning more, always wanting to learn as much as he could. And I just think he's it was just incredibly gifted entrepreneur is the right place, the right time. And you know, you could argue some of the other people made mistakes. You could argue they were too early. And it's like all markets, their time comes. And sometimes being too early is just as wrong as being too late. You know, you just timing's a big deal. And so, you know, he was at the right place at the right time. In fact, he was at a time when people were starting to not like social networks. They were like, well, Friendster didn't work, Drive didn't work. This is one for colleges, big whoop. Um, and you know, he benefited from the fact that not that many people cared anymore about social networking. He just quietly went about his business and hired awesome technical people and made it happen. I'm sure you will okay. agree. This was incredibly educational and inspiring. Please join me in thanking Mike.